Wow, that was a little bit tricky. Um, good afternoon. Uh, as Henrik just mentioned, I'm Dan, uh, and I'll be doing a talk on a beginner's guide to Monte Carlo simulations. Um, he's already just briefly outlined my background, um, but I've just completed a master's in assessment, measurement, and evaluation at UIO. My background um, originally was from geology, um, in particular, I did volcanology, um, but I'm currently working as a research assistant at IPED and the law faculty. Um, and yeah, I've um, got around about two years worth of experience with R. Um, and this is important for just to um, mention um, because today's talk is primarily looking at um, how you can use Monte Carlo simulations in R, um, but also to give information for people who are maybe slightly new to R um, or they might want to have more skills, more advanced skills. So um, today what I'll be talking about is um, backgrounds to Monte Carlo simulations, uh, what multi, um, Monte Carlo simulations can be used for. I'll give some examples of Monte Carlo sim simulations in R, um, how I've used Monte Carlo simulations, um, some of the problems that I faced, and some tips for beginners who were at the same stage. Uh, um, and first of all, I want to just mention what is a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and the essence of Monte Carlo simulation is that you repeatedly, randomly sample um, to obtain a numerical result or estimate of a parameter. And by doing so in R, we're not completely random, we're actually pseudo-randomly sampling from a known um, probability distribution. Um, and this is, there are slight differences you'll hear in terminology in the literature between Monte Carlo simulations and Monte Carlo methods. Um, I won't go into detail, but today I'll be mostly just focusing on Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so the history of Monte Carlo is quite interesting. One of the earliest variants was um, Buffon's needle problem. So you could estimate pi by essentially dropping needles. Um, and, but really when the first true Monte Carlo simulation that came about or thought about was done by Enrico Fermi to understand ne neutron diffusion. Um, and when researchers from Los Alamos who were working on nuclear weapons, um, they had to come up with a secret code name and they called it Monte Carlo. And this was turned by Nicholas Metropolis with his Stanislav Ulam and John von Neumann colleagues. So apart from what they had used Monte Carlo simulations for, there are many reasons that today we want to use Monte Carlo simulations. And these can verify derivations in codes, so we can determine integrals. Um, we can investigate new methods of analysis. We can um, utilize um, different methods in different scenarios. And also for future studies, we can see whether that we there's a certain sample size that is required to get significant results. Um, and sometimes it's just used to compare two or more statistical methods, which is commonly done in the field that I work in or used to work in. Um, but also um, for risk analysis, you estimate uncertainty of parameters. So there are several um, advantages to using Monte Carlo simulations. Um, in particular, real life experiments, especially in the social sciences, uh, natural sciences, they can be quite expensive. Um, so we can, or in some cases difficult. So we can use Monte Carlo simulations or simulations in general. Um, and what I mean by no data collection here is that rather than having to go out, collect the data, it's much simpler. We can actually create our own data. Um, and the other part is that we can change and vary the settings of our choosing. And so that means we can kind of get a range of outcomes depending on our model. Um, and we can also look at the unexpected behaviors of models, which many other methods um, 
There are some other methods that can do this, but it's much simpler with Monte Carlo simulations. And it does make quite accurate decisions when using Monte Carlo simulation. Um, so this is just, a list. I won't go through every single application of Monte Carlo simulations because there are just so many fields that use this. But in particular, the interesting ones are in my field with education measurement, Monte Carlo simulations are used especially trying to better understand different um, statistical methods that we use to see whether they work properly in different situations. Um, in particular, in my field where I was working with volcanology, it was risk analysis to see what scenarios would take place and which areas are most likely to be affected. So there's a general procedure that takes place when doing a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, and I've kind of adapted this from a paper by Morris et al from 2019. And he kind of suggested that first you have to outline your aim. You have to define what data generating mechanism, and I'll go into this in more detail, but essentially you're randomly drawing from a known model or distribution. So say a uniform distribution or a normal distribution. Um, and then, or you can also be sampling from a data set you know very well with replacement. Um, also, this is sometimes termed bootstrapping. Um, and then there are also different methods or models that you can use to analyze the, the data you just randomly generated. Then you'll have some estimates, what he calls, or targets of analysis. So these can be regression coefficients, or in most circumstances with Monte Carlo simulations, it's essentially just the mean of essentially you're taking the sum of all of the events divided by the total number of replications. And then we also have performance measures, um, standard errors that we have to also um, analyze. And then part of the procedure is also just coding and executing what we've designed or planned. And then it's um, doing some analysis of the results and then reporting on the results. And this will be kind of the structure of my talk today. There are some general concepts that need to be understood. That, I could have gone really complicated with the mathematics, but just to pull it back a little bit, essentially Monte Carlo simulations work because essentially we replicate or repeat a experiment nearly um, an infinite number of times. It's not really truly infinite. We may do it a million times, for example, but in many cases, because of the law of large numbers, it suggests that as the number of replications or NSIM I'm calling um, goes towards infinity, the estimate approximates a parameter or a true value. However, there we need to be take into consideration that we have to use valid assumptions um, and appropriate outcome generating methods to get um, good estimates of our parameters. As well, we want to make the variance of our estimate to be as small as possible. We also want the confidence interval be, to be contained, uh, the parameters to be contained within our confidence interval. And one of the difficulties of Monte Carlo simulations is that the rate of convergence, or convergence meaning that, that your estimate is good to calculate your parameter, it generally is quite slow for Monte Carlo simulation and it follows a one on square root by the number of replications. So this means that as we move towards um, our, our actual value of our parameter, we need a very, very large sample size. But to illustrate just simply how we can do Monte Carlo simulations in R, I'm gonna use a quite common example with, with tossing a coin. So we know that the probability is 50% for getting either heads or tails. Now, imagine flipping a coin 10 times. The aim what we want to maybe look at is, um, we might want to estimate the probability of getting more than two heads. So in this case, I'm, um, I'm saying that we could either flip the coin infinite number of times, but obviously we get sore, sore thumbs, we could get hand cramps, or we could also just use an equation to actually solve for it. But in the case, let's use R instead. And so here we have an experiment. 
um, and I've, in R, this is kind of a, the function, and we can represent that as a function, sorry. And so here, this function I've said is the number of flips of the coin is n. I'm saying that zero is tails and one is heads. And essentially, we are flipping this coin, oh, this simulation is flipping and sampling um, with zeros and ones and replacing each time. And so by summing them, if the value is greater than or equal to three, um, it essentially gets a one. So when we, um, if it's greater than or equal to three. So we can replicate this a million times. And this is what I've done. And then by the simulation, what we're doing is, is essentially using the replicate function, which is one way of doing Monte Carlo simulation in R. And essentially we're taking the mean of all the values that we've gotten due to this replication. So we're getting zeros and ones and essentially taking the mean. And when we do this, what we find is, is that the value is about 0.954, which is when we then use um, the probability binomial distribution, probability of binomial distribution, we actually find the value is quite close to so-called the true value or the parameter. And this is because that, because um, we're looking at this outcome measure of a mean, we're essentially saying that the number of events, so the number of events that were true, so number of, of the 10 um, flips, more than two um, were heads. And we divide that by the total number of replications. And this is getting close because we use so many number of replications. So another example could be estimating pi. So for example, um, just imagine you want to um, estimate pi, but instead of just Googling for the value of pi, we could actually do it through Monte Carlo simulations. And this is actually quite a common um, problem that you can see on the internet in many circumstances. And um, this is commonly done in MATLAB or Python, so I've just adapted it for R. And essentially the problem is, is that you have a circle, you've taken a, a quadrant, um, of this circle that has a radius of one and it's inside a square of one unit square. And in essence, the area, the actual true area is pi on four. Now, underneath the curve, I should say. Whereas what we're gonna do here, we're actually going to randomly scatter points in, um, inside this square. And so we're gonna count the number of points that are inside the quadrant and then by taking the ratio of the total number of points that are inside the square by and divide sorry the total number of points inside divided by the total number of points and multiplying by four we should get an estimate of pi and so to do this in R I've just chosen 100,000 replications um, and I've assumed a a random uniform distributions going from zero to one for X, for the X axis and for the Y axis. And essentially using the equation or the formulae for um, this arc, which is X squared plus Y squared equals one. Essentially we're saying that any values that are less than or equal to one, we take the sum, we divide it by the total number of replications and we can get um, an estimate of pi. Um, and it's not fantastic, but the point is, is that we're trying to um, use this as a proof of concept. And as you can see from the, um, the animation is that as we increase the number of replications, we get a better approximation of pi. Um, and it's also um, important to understand also to realize that it's a matter of convergence here as well. So meaning that as we get larger number of replications, we should be getting closer to the actual value of pi. So the way that I use Monte Carlo simulations was I wanted to test essentially the um, accuracy of different equating methods or 
um, statistical methods that we use in educational measurement on high stakes exams. So you can think of it taking your high school diploma exams and essentially you can either take the exam during spring or in autumn. However, one of the tests is slightly more difficult. So essentially it's slightly harder. And because there are two groups that are taking it, what we're trying to do is essentially we're saying, we're assuming that because we've got a large population, we can randomly se select from this population. And the problem is of having tests that have different difficulties is unfair for both groups. Just say if one group was given an easier test, they're given us unfair advantage. So we need to what we call equate the scores. So in essence, the aim of my study was to evaluate how accurate the ranking of students were when using two broad equating methods. And briefly, uh, last time for one of the talks, Henrik was talking about IRT, and I used the similar methods, but in the framework of equating. And so the essence of my study was to compare these equating methods, but I was also trying to um, have very large number of replications to get um, at the mean accuracy of classifying students. So essentially how, by increasing the number of replications, I could see how well we were classifying students using these different equating methods. And this is why I use Monte Carlo simulation. So just briefly some definitions. So equating essentially is to ensure fairness when you're taking a test. And so when you, um, uh, because you don't have equal scores, you need to adjust those test scores so that the scores can be, um, so you can rank individuals correctly. And then classification accuracy is essentially, or the accuracy that we classify individuals is the um, accuracy of the decisions when using these tests. So in my simulation, I had different test scenarios or inputs into my simulation. So I varied test length, um, sample size, cutoff scores, um, the, uh, the model specification. But I also had essentially two outcome variables or performance measures. And this was the mean accuracy. So essentially, I ranked individuals first and then I said were they classified correctly based upon their true ranking and their um, uh, their estimated ranking and so I divide that by the total number um, of individuals that take taken the test and then I also divide that by the total replication um, and what I also had to do was see whether that estimate was accurate or not. And so this is where I use standard errors. Um, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to use Monte Carlo standard error measures, um, which I should mention, there's a paper called Morris et al that I previously mentioned before, that actually outlines some good um, or appropriate uh, performance measures and their corresponding standard errors. And you should have a look at that paper, I would advise you because um, it's important if you're publish publishing your results. And so when it came to the coding, essentially the first part of it was to simulate um, the, or not necessarily simulate, but to outline the different variables or inputs. So here for N, this was the, the sample size. So I had 200, 1,000 and 5,000. I also changed the number of items. So I had three settings, so 20 items, 40 items, and 80 items. And I also had this um, specification. So whether I used a unidimensional or multidimensional model. The next part was simulating for these different test settings, the item parameters that I need to use in my models. And here is an important part of Monte Carlo simulations. It's to do with assumptions. When you're doing Monte Carlo simulations, your assumptions have to be based upon some reasoning. Um, and that could be that you know that you, your, um, so there's no, your, the values are normally distributed because you have such a large number of values, which is related to the central limit theorem. Um, but for me, I was basing 
um, why I use these particular um, taking random values from these distributions based upon previous studies. So rather than using um, rep the replication function or replicate function and just a very simple um, function that I showed in those previous two examples, I needed to use for loops um, and nested, I had to nest um, specific for loops depending on um, the different variables that I was looking at. So um, for example, the first loop was essentially looking at the length of the test. And then the second loop was varying for the sample size and then the model specification. And then finally, the, the last loop, which is um, 4J in one, is actually the number of replications. So essentially, I and for this study, I had 100 replications. So for each replication though, I wasn't varying the test. I was keeping the test constant. However, what I was varying was, and this is shown with so-called their true abilities, I was varying the abilities of the two different groups. And I assumed that they were normally distributed. And this is because generally, the, we can assume that ability of students is normally distributed in education, especially when we're using um, IRT. It's important to do so. So when we're coding for the next part, which is the outcome measures, essentially what I was doing in this function was I was estimating the, um, the mean, uh, the Monte Carlo mean essentially of the accuracy. The accuracy. Um, and I was also calculating the confidence intervals um, by using by using the standard errors by estimating from using bootstrapping, um, and this is the for loop to estimate the bootstraps. So when we reported the data, there were different methods that we had to use to report the data, um, and it's quite important actually because you have so much data that there are some things that you can't include, especially that for my thesis. So it was very difficult for me to determine what was important and what was not. But the best way that we could show the data was graphically as shown in the um, graph on the right. And this is just one setting out of um, another 20, essentially 36 other settings that I can show. And so this is where I come to now with my talk relating to the problems that I had. And this, everyone doesn't have the same problems. You may find them intuitive, so you, you won't encounter them. But one of the things that I found difficult for me, but I think it's complicated in the field when using Monte Carlo simulations is the number of replications that are needed. One of the criticisms of my master thesis was, did I actually have um, the, an adequate number of repetitions or did I prove that I had adequate number of repetitions or replications? So one way that um, people can get around this is that there is a formula um, that many people use, which is relating to um, the coverage and its confidence interval to estimate the sample size. Another method is to test to get a stable estimate. So essentially looking at the rate of convergence. And when you reach a predefined level, you can say, okay, this is the number of repetitions that's necessary. Um, but then you also can use while loop. So essentially I could have said, okay, once we reach a um, mean accuracy and standard error of a particular value, this is when we want it to stop. Because um, the problem is, is that so many studies can give you recommendations. And one paper had shown that some people recommend from 50 to 10,000. So the most important thing is to just really justify your answer um, by either using different methods, tests or whatever to justify the number of replications that you use. Some of the other problems that I had faced was how many scenarios should I test? So, because just with my 
um, simulation, I had 36 different combinations of, depending on the variables that I had. So when I also then replicated it 100 times, this was essentially a lot of data. Um, and it took a lot of time to um, estimate these values using the, um, the, met the code that I had used. And so one of the criticisms again of my thesis was that I had way too many variables, but this might not be the same for everybody. So you have to balance, you need to get adequate information and you have to control for the variables um, appropriately. You need to figure out for your example, or if you're going to do this in the future, what is the best number of variables that you need. And this comes to the point that in the end, you can have a lot of data. For mine, I didn't have a lot, but I still had 10 gigabytes of data. Um, and so one of the questions that I was asking myself, how do I actually present this data? I mean, there was so much data, how do I present it nicely and eloquently? Because you don't want to neglect data that could be important, but you also don't want to, you can't in some circumstances show too much data. So it also comes down to, there's a balance between the amount of computation time that you have to do Monte Carlo simulations, because just for myself to get this data, I was, uh, it took me around about four days to do this simulation. Um, so you just can't keep repeating this. Um, and some people may take even longer, but then you also want enough data to have a significant result. And just to show you just how difficult it was for my thesis to represent the data, these tables were only representing a portion of the uh, data that I had collected. So one of the, like I was just mentioning, sometime, especially my code took forever to um, run. Um, and there are some solutions though. Um, one of them is parallel com computing and there is a fantastic library called Parallel that you can use in R. Some functions also have, uh, sorry, uh, in some cases at some universities, um, and areas you may have high power computing. Um, however, not all coding languages can be available. Um, one of the things that I should take on board myself, which I've realized later on that I should really reduce the number of loops because they are quite inefficient in R. Um, and the other thing is, is that one of the things that I found was that some functions were slower than others. And so it's really important to know exactly how the function works. And if you find that they are slower, which you can also get times for, for just say just a single replication, you can kind of make your own function to make it faster. Um, so again, it's about balancing the amount of time, but also gaining enough data for your study. Uh, this is more for me as a beginner. Um, I found that my code was huge when I first did it, um, which makes it quite inefficient and you have a lot of errors actually. So I think one of the things that I learned to do was reduce the redundancy, um, redundant code by using um, inbuilt functions like apply, if else, those kind of things. Um, one of the things that I tried to do was try to keep it simple, which I know it seems obvious, but when you're doing it, it, it does get confusing sometimes. So you just kind of have to take a step back and just tr take a small part of it, do one part first, finish that, and then go to the next problem. And I think learning from others was really important for me. So going on Stack Exchange, because some of the problems that I had were actually solved by people and they had very uh, efficient codes. Um, and the other thing was planning. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, one of the things that I was doing that my, one of the professors in my course was saying, do not copy and paste, but it is easy. But for Monte Carlo simulations, you can make mistakes by copy and, copy and pasting. And I know that seems obvious, um, and, but I think the better option is using functions. If you have to do a repetitive task,
it's really advantageous to use functions. They are extremely useful for Monte Carlo simulations, especially because they're quite efficient in um, R. Um, and essentially, one of the things that I had problems with, especially, was how do I know if I'm right? Because the problem that I had with my topic was I didn't actually have a true value. So I didn't have the value of pi that I could turn to to kind of estimate bias um, or any other performance um, measures. So it became a problem for me. So one of the things that I was told to do by my supervisor, which was helpful, was break up the section, start small again, find where depending on which section has problems. Um, and that means also just going with one, one round of replication. Um, also saving your data. So even if there is something wrong, at least you can go back to that data so you don't have to repeat the whole simulation again. Um, many people say to plot the data, and, and I found that also very useful. So particularly, um, one of the things that I had problems with was um, the estimates of my item parameters. So if I plotted them, I would see that there was something wrong with them. Um, one of the things that you can have checks throughout the code, so you can kind of like have parts where if it fails, it will bring an error and then you can keep, you can still continue going, but you can find where that problem may have occurred. Um, I think one of the more important things was to have my supervisor to kind of make a smaller version of my simulation. And so to kind of just check with him and compare. Um, and also using benchmarking. So if you've got previous data, maybe you could use that to compare your values or compare the results that you're getting. And um, one of the other things is in some cases, you may have problems that are quite difficult to um, to get your head around, so maybe using a different computer, and in some very rare circumstances, maybe using a different software because different uh, software, different coding languages. Because in some circumstances, um, different languages use different um, alg uh, pseudo-random algorithms. So, having said all this, there is still um, there is still a package that you can use in R, and I didn't mention it because. To be honest, I've, I have never used it because my simulation was quite complicated. Um, so I need to make sure what was going in and what was coming out was, I could actually see what was going on inside. But some people say that the Monte Carlo package is very good. Um, it's very, especially it's very useful for making tables from your results. It, does it in a nice and eloquent way. So I would give advice that if there's anything, um, have a look at the package Monte Carlo. So just some suggestions from my side of things. Um, I think I should have mentioned it a bit more before, but um, the set.seed function, essentially you need to make sure you keep track of your seeds. And so that means when you are running your simulations actually extract or at least have a list or, or just a vector of the seeds that you have used in your simulation. And that's for several reasons. One, replication, for people to replicate later. And I think the other part is, is that um, you may have some overlap with the um, the seeds if you don't keep track of them. So it's really important to um, keep those values with you so that to replicate, but also, yeah, so you don't get that overlap, like I mentioned. Um, planning, and I've said this many times, it is, I found it still very difficult to see the, all the problems, but by having a plan, it did really help me kind of get through those problems. Um, I think the big part is start small um, and just start with one replication and then go to 10 replications. And then once you're starting to see that there's no problems with just doing 10 replications, then you can go to 1,000, 100,000, which may take several days, but you can kind of be confident that the results are going to be going to work. 
Um, and in some cases, you may get um, non-convergence. Um, and there are ways to go around this. And it's related to handling errors. And one of the functions that we learned was this try function. Essentially, your code continues even if you have an error. Um, and that's quite helpful because um, in many circumstances, you may be running your code over the weekend, it stops and you've just wasted a whole weekend. So um, try is a really cool function. Um, save throughout your code. So every, so all the important bits of data that you should save to not have to redo the whole simulation again is quite helpful. It's also useful for just for replication again. Um, I mentioned about convergence, um, but also I think the thing, and I, this was advice that I should have taken on board myself was that you can't do everything. Um, and it was something that I realized from my thesis that I had so many variables that it was difficult to portray my data or to show my data, but also it was just time consuming. Um, and I think the big thing is be patient. Um, there are many times when, like I said, I was furious because it is just, it can be quite infuriating. Um, so you just, yeah, one of the things I would just give advice would be it takes time. Um, and especially like if you're doing a thesis and you're using Monte Carlo simulations, just keep in mind that it does take longer than, than you think. And, and if you're doing grant proposals, maybe you can mention, um, you, maybe your estimate of how long it will take might be a bit longer. Um, here are some helpful resources that I found and um, used. Um, the book um, is quite good to get a good overview of some of the Monte Carlo methods when using it with us. So there are some examples in the book. Um, the Morris et al. 2019 paper is for any level, especially if you're doing medicine or ed education from my field, uh, it was extremely useful. Um, and I think one of the other ones was um, helpful resources was Mudfum um, 2011. And they kind of gave me a guideline of number of replications that I need to do for my study. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, the Monte Carlo package is something that you can look further into.